Hello, everybody. Hey, you know, you are allowed to say hello. That's all right. All right, so the topic I will be speaking from tonight is uh, spiritual evolution. So uh, I want us to think ahead for a second and not just say uh, 5, 10, 15 years. Imagine you were thinking ahead a million years, right? Now, when you think about a million years ahead and the kinds of things that we could uh, progress towards at that point, your mind might go to, say, technological advancements. And we've been talking about technological advancements. And we imagine that that will be moving along very well. But what I want you to think about is what kind of advancements will we ourselves have experienced? Right, so a million years. Think about it. Um, science fiction would have us to think that perhaps we would be able to communicate with one another without talking, right? Without words, we'd be able to communicate. Um, we would be able to know how people were feeling from distant uh, locations. We could just kind of tune in to our loved ones, perhaps, and know how it is and what was going on, right? And then be all right with that. So we can imagine that these kinds of things would happen. Um, now, what would prevent us from being a continued civilization into, say, a million years from now? Well, one thing that we are currently aware of, and um, many people are thinking about this, uh, there's a gap between what is our personal, spiritual, governmental evolution, and then our technological evolution. There's a space, a gap, if you would. Um, and we are approaching a time when that gap is becoming dangerous. Essentially, we become babies with chainsaws, if you really want to think about it. And we have a little bit of uh, developing to do. So um, what I'm thinking will help us to close this gap um, is meditative practices that aim at increasing our alpha wave patterns. So I want to talk about my personal experience with meditation, my personal experience with increase in alpha wave production, um, and what kind of things I've seen and experienced as a result. So um, before we do this, uh, let me talk a little bit about different brain wave patterns, uh, in case you're unaware. So uh, delta, delta waves, that's when you're sleeping. So if you're out, sleep, that's delta. If you are daydreaming, you know, awake, daydreaming, your mind's kind of wandering around, but you're awake, those are theta waves, is what we are thinking about. Now, uh, if you're interacting, like this kind of thing we're doing now, for most folks, those end up being beta waves, is how that works. Now, in meditative practices, what we find ourselves going into is alpha. Now, the interactive, the beta waves that we use, those tend to help us out with our problem solving, um, our understanding information, our taking in stuff from the environment, and recognizing how to use that in our interaction. Um, our alpha waves, they tend to deal with relaxation, uh, being calm, but also things like intuition and stuff like that. So through research and people uh, testing the effects of meditation, uh, what they came to find out was that people who are in very elite classes of things tend to produce higher levels of alpha waves right prior to the thing that they are engaged in. So let's say uh, an elite golfer. An elite golfer, as different from a regular, you know, everyday golfer or an amateur or what have you, um, right prior to them making their swing, scientists have noticed that they produce a burst of alpha waves in their brain first, and then the swing happens, and then they end up making it quite often. And one thing that ends up differentiating these experts is just that. So let's think about this for a second. Um, if you were a golfer and you were thinking that you wanted to increase your golf game or what have you, and you came to find out that if you were to meditate a bit, understand how to do a few of these practices, that you could then increase and approximate the elite. Would that not be something you would want to do, right? You could do those things and increase. So what I'm saying is that these same things, just like it can help an elite golfer, um, it can also help everyday people, everyday people, uh, in their connecting to their own personal greatness and their own personal truths. Now, because everybody's not going to be a golfer. All right, now. What ends up going down for me personally um, is I start learning about meditation about four years ago. Uh, before that, you know, I've been a professor about 17 years now. Um, and once I started meditating four years ago, I had a certain aptitude that I enjoy in my professing. Um, but as I began to get more proficient in meditation, I began to notice increasing proficiency in my instruction. And then I began to notice more things phenomenologically. Um, and by phenomenologically, uh, what I mean is the experience of what is happening. 
So um, people began to be aware that I was doing this meditation thing, and um, I started having more people come and join meditations, and I started leading group meditations. Well, word got out, and there was a particular scientist who was doing a study, um, and someone suggested to them that they include me in on the study. Uh, so I, you know, went on down and uh, had a bunch of leads connected to my head, and you know, each lock that I have had a lead beside it, and then I was connected to a screen, and so it, you know, it's pretty interesting. All right, so the test went down, and then you know, I left being none the wiser as to what was happening. But one thing I was allowed to do uh, was talk very openly and very candidly about what I'm experiencing phenomenologically. So it was always the case that um, I felt like I could explain things pretty decently. Um, I always felt that once I was in a room full of people and they were confused about something and I understood what it was, uh, then I was able to relay that information, and I was able to relay that information very well. As I began to meditate more and more, what started happening phenomenologically is that um, when people would have a question before me, I could feel it. Uh, and then I would be able to respond sometimes before they would even say anything verbally, to the point that students began to ask me, was I reading their minds? Now, that seems kind of interesting. Um, and at first, I was unwilling kind of to talk about that, because you can imagine if someone stands before you and says, hey, I've got a way to start knowing what you're feeling. Well, that can be, you know, off-putting, unless we have the scientific research to back it up. So about a year after uh, that brain mapping was done of me, the researcher called me and said, you need to come back down here, uh, and we should do some more tests, and I would like to explain to you kind of what we're finding here, uh, because then she started using really big words like intentional evolutionary adaptation. Now, that's pretty interesting. And they were saying, what we think you are doing is an evolutionary adaptation um, that is actually helping you to do your profession. And I was like, wow, that seems pretty interesting. Uh, can you give it to me in short? Because at that point, I, you know, I, I, since then, I've learned much more about waves and all that. But at that point, I really didn't understand. So I was like, can you explain that to me? And she said, OK, well, it's like this. Most people, when they are in interactions like this, uh, they are using beta waves because that helps you. They're high frequency, and they help you to uh, navigate your situation, understand how to process information, the things we normally do when we're talking. She says, but that's not what you're doing. Uh, what you're doing is you've got an expanded range where you're using alpha and beta waves in times when most people are just using betas. And I was like, wow, okay, that seems interesting. And then she said, the reason it's an intentional evolutionary adaptation is because we mapped out your brain, and what we've seen is that um, in a great deal of it, you are producing alpha waves at a rate of less than 3% of the population. Now, obviously, that got my attention. Um, but then she said, however, there is one area where you're significantly less than 1% of the population. Uh, so what I did, this is called Broadman Area 9 in the brain. And so she looked up Broadman Area 9 in the brain to explain what things those are associated with. And they were all things associated with my profession. And so what it demonstrated was, though I already seem to have had an aptitude um, through my intentional focusing towards the thing that I'm actually doing, I increased my aptitude. And that demonstration is hard. You can see it in my brain. So I'm going to show you that now. <clears throat> First. Um, the Broadman area that we're discussing. Again, um, there were many areas that were demonstrating high alpha wave production, um, but this was the area where it was the highest. And as we see, um, different memory functions, execu executive control of behavior, language processing and verbal fluency, processing content of nonverbal communication. Now, this is where it gets pretty interesting, and I'll explain it to you how I experience it phenomenal phenomenologically in a moment. Um, self-reflection and decision-making, planning and calculation, inferential reasoning, and then uh, attribution of intention to others. Now, intention, excuse me. Now, this is relatively important as well because in a teaching environment, uh, in an honest environment where there's a student who has a serious question, um, if I can tune into that person, it helps me to understand what it is. Okay, so in this area, first let's talk on again, really quickly about uh, standard deviations. So at two standard deviations, just to brush up on your math really quickly, quickly um, at two standard deviations out from center, you are looking at uh, above that is 95 you know, percent of the population. So 5% of the population uh, is above two standards. 
three standard deviations out, um, as you see, goes to 99.7% of the population, so that's 0.3% of the population, if it was at full three. <clears throat> In Broadman Area 9, I am producing alpha waves at 2.8 standard deviation. Now, what that ends up meaning um, is that, well, I'll, I'll show you another graphic that, puts, that makes a bit more sense of that. Um, beta waves end up moving kind of fast at a low, ampli at a low uh, amplitude. Alpha waves move a bit slower, but at a higher amplitude is what ends up happening. <clears throat> I situate myself uh, at a resting state of cognition between the two so that I have access in a situation like this to my alphas and my betas. Now what that ends up doing uh, is it makes me able to perceive and observe as if I weren't in the room and interact as if I'm in the room at the same time. So that produces some interesting stuff. Now the next slide I'm about to show you, um, what it demonstrates is what, um, what the wave patterns would end up looking like represented by red and green. Green is what the quote average brain would be producing um, at the same, in the same area during normal interaction. When you get up to about 5% of the population, you will begin to see red dots appear on the spectrum. So to show you what mine looks like, the normal typical activity is on the left, and on the right is what my activity ends up looking like. What you see is a combined alpha and, and beta. Okay, now what this uh, experientially ends up meaning uh, is this. No, it's not that I'm reading minds. No, it's not that I'm seeing the future. What's happening is through meditation, um, a great deal happens. And obviously, I will be suggesting that everyone incorporate a meditative practice. And I'll explain how and what uh, here momentarily. But what we are absolutely sure of is that through your meditations, you increase your alpha wave production. Your things like anger, uh, anger are alpha wave cutters. They cut alpha waves down. So when you learn how to meditate, you begin to decrease, and you can do it at will, your agitations, uh, things that would anger you, things that would upset you. Once you've sat your anger aside, then it allows you to get to what usually is the source of those kinds of things, which is your fear. Once you start working through your fear, then you can learn how to embrace your love and your passion. When you start embracing your passion, then you're able to more clearly and easily remove those things from your life that detract from that and that end up not being that thing. Okay, so in an interaction, this is the way it ends up working. Uh, most of us will think about something, we'll form it into a symbol, which, you know, a word, and then say the word out. And then the other person hears the symbol, decodes it back down into meanings, okay? What happens with me, um, the easiest way to explain it is imagine uh, a still water surface. And imagine I was to drop a pebble in it and a bunch of waves were to go out. Could you imagine that? Okay. Now imagine the reverse. Imagine the waves coming back in and then the stone popping back up out of the water. Imagine that. Okay. So what happens whenever I'm in this um, observational plus interactive mode? When a person begins to talk, it's like uh, that rock is dropping. And what I end up seeing uh, are the waves of their meanings. Um, I say see, but it's not a visual thing, it's a, it's a feeling. Um, but I come to understand the ripples that are behind the word that they are saying. So quite often what's happening is I see the structure and then I can understand what symbol is required to match up what they need to think uh, or what they need to hear with what's blocking their understanding in some way and direct them to it a lot easier. So it's not that I would be reading their minds. It's that if you can see the ripples that are about to produce the rock, then you can see that the rock is coming, or the word, or the question, uh, or the comment. So I began to notice that, and that's pretty spectacular. Um, but then I began as I increased further, because there's something about knowing what you're doing while you're doing it that helps you push it a little bit further and faster. And so as I began to focus more in the meditative moments uh, and focus other people towards this idea. Remember the waves that go out when there's one person? What I then start seeing is the more that a person is aligned with their truth, the more beautiful those waves end up being. Um, and when there's a group of people and there are many waves happening at one time, it produces a beautiful symphony, if you would. 
it produces a tapestry, a picture, if you would. Um, and then what that has allowed me to see is this. Um, as it turns out, each of us has something very beautiful, very special, very passionate inside of us. Not all of us are demonstrating that. Through our meditative practices, we can find out what that thing is. And as you begin to hone in on your own perfect beauty, we then start to see that we all function as individual perfect pieces to an overall tapestry, a very large tapestry that is in itself beautiful. By doing this, we usher in a global civilization, a divine culture, a connection between all folks, where we erase all of our isms, where we understand that there's not a difference in race and sex and age and gender and all these things, and we can understand people um, at more connected levels. We understand that we are all connected. And when we can see those connections, and by see, I mean experience and feel. So if you are a member of a household of faith, meaning you pray, if you pray, then I would say add meditation, because praying is you talking, and meditating is you listening. And if you have a relationship with God, then you should probably listen more than you talk. Uh, if you're one that has a physical practice, let's suppose you do um, yoga or some other thing, then I ask that you increase your meditative practices with your physical practice. Even if you're not involved in a household of faith or you're not involved in a physical practice, you can still add in a meditative practice because we already know from the scientific perspective, physiological perspective, you will decrease your risk of heart attack, hypertension, heart disease by 48%, uh, meditating just 20 minutes twice a day. <clears throat> so the two things I would like to leave you with, get into your meditation. By meditation, I mean find a place, be quiet, at least 15 minutes. We say that 15 minutes it takes to quiet your mind. Really, it takes about 15 minutes to slow down those betas and get them down to your alphas. And then you sit and just relax, breathe, focus, not thinking about anything, very effortlessly. You do this twice a day, 15, 20 minutes, and your life, our lives will change. Thank you.